Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. And um, before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? <clears throat> Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence here as we open your word together. We're thankful for all the things that you have been teaching us uh, in this study of Daniel's last vision. And we just pray, Lord, that um, you can continue to lead and guide. Uh, we ask that the things that we learn can be beneficial to us and in the work that you've given us to do. We pray for a power and conviction in our lives that we can follow you with all of our hearts. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again, everyone. So <clears throat> what we've done, because I did a bit of a review at the beginning of yesterday's study, but you can see we have a lot of work uh, cut out for us. And I, I guess the best thing that we could do is take this line of, of Esther and draw it out. Now, I did have, of course, the other drawing uh, with some of the dates in it, but I want to just do this again. And and this time put it on a line that if we can figure out uh, a time in the end or how we understand this as a regular line, not just dates. <clears throat> um, I can't remember if there was any details in this story that uh, um, that we had missed. I don't think so. I mean, we've gone over it before. So we're going to go to um, this. So this was the line that I had originally drawn um, when we had gone through Esther the first time. So this has the decree. It has some of the spans of time. Um, if you look at the top of this drawing, I also connected this history back to Saul and Amalek and uh so Saul, son of Kish, and Agag, who's an uh, Amalekite, Amalek. And, um, and of course, we connect them to Mordecai and Haman. So that's, of course, an interesting detail. And that was just a study that we've done before. And then I had drawn out uh, this span of the decrees. And then I also had this span, which is basically this is the line we're going to draw it again, this one at the bottom just do it a little differently so um, yeah so we're going to start a new slide here um i'm just going to copy this okay this is all nothing Okay, so somehow we're going to end up with a line like this. I don't know what we're going to do yet. When the time of the end is going to be, we'll end up obviously having some spans in there that will be marked. Um, so if we're going to uh, start this line of, and, and how would how would we describe this line? What is this line of? Would it just be because this line is going to be uh, including this story from chapter one to three. And then we're saying that's the first, second, and third angels messages. Um, now we're also including uh, what we saw in the Apocrypha. So, I mean, what, what would we put here? So if we normally have a time at the end, uh, the arrival of the first message. So what is the first message? What is the period of darkness? How would we draw out this line of Esther 1, 2, and 3? Because normally you have a time at the end. So what's, what's ending? 
um, when Xerxes, it, with Xerxes in chapter one, is there anything that we can do to mark the time of the end? Do we just take, normally you have a time prophecy uh, of yeah. some sort. Of things. You, have yeah. two things, you have two things that are ending in, in Esther chapter one. Okay. Well, you have... have you have the feast that will end after 187 days, and you have his marriage to Vashti that will end. Okay, yeah. So, so this um, this 187 days. I mean, it's not a prophecy, but it's definitely a symbolic period of time. Right. And. Um, but, you know, we have to take this whole chapter. We have to figure out um, what this this chapter is, how it is the first message. Um, you know, it's a period of darkness normally that you have preceding a line. Um, now, remember, we, we had connected this to uh, that history. Uh, so I'll just go back. I should remember the slide number. Um, so I'll do this this way. Right. So so here we have this um, this history here, and and maybe we could s sort of connect this to a period of time that's ending, that there is some kind of conflict that has gone on that now is being um, represented in this history. Now here we have, you know, approximately 1,325 years. We don't know exactly when, you know, Amalek was born or whatever, but uh, this goes back to Amalek. Um, we could connect it to uh, the events um, in 1533 BC, because there we'd have a specific span of time. So you got about 950 years. Uh, that would be going to um, the third year of Xerxes. So 950 years from 1533 to, no, it's not, not it's a thousand, pardon me, a thousand and fifty years to 483. So 1533 minus 483, yeah, that's going to be a thousand and fifty years. Does that give us any information that because this is the conflict with Amalek, right? Okay, so approximately from the time of Amalek's birth to the time that Saul faces against Agag, is approximately a period of 707 years. Right? Okay. So you're going from uh, 1093 to, to 1800. Like you okay. said, approximately. It shows about 1800 BC to 1093 would be approximately 707 years, wouldn't it? No. Um, to to um, to Saul, you mean? Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. So 707 years. Yeah. Now, it's interesting. 
in this, I mean, we recognize the fact that Amalek is a son of Esau through his concubine, right? Mm -hmm. Yet, when the children of Israel are faced with Balaam and his, you know, his attempt to obtain gain that he <clears throat> he should not have had we are faced with agag in numbers this is the prophecy that you're you're referring to isn't it in 1493 um yes so the prophecy against amalek's in 1493 so amalek attacks <laughs> And 40 years later, there's going to be this prophecy against Amalek, because that's in Deuteronomy. And that's going to be, uh, we're going to find that that's going to be fulfilled 400 years later, according uh, to the spirit of prophecy. So we're taking it that 400 years from when the prophecy is given. And that brings us to 1093. Um, so that's why we have that date. So we're just well, taking well, While I'm recognizing the validity of Deuteronomy 2517. Mm -hmm. It's also interesting that the first mention of Agag occurs in Numbers. Okay. Well, yes, because that's going to be, uh, let me see here. What's what's the chapter in verse? 247. Yeah. Yeah, and this is Balaam's prophecy. Um, yeah, so it's 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 a name that you know Agag is almost like a title or just a really common name, just like Pharaoh, right? But of the mentions of Agag in the Bible. This is the first reference. All of the other references come up in 1 Samuel. And it's a seven and one situation. Yeah. Now, it is possible that Agag here in Numbers, just according to uh, what I'm reading here, it could be Magog. Um it actually says Magag, not Agag. And so it might not be a reference to Agag at all. Okay, and what version is that coming from? The Hebrew Bible. Okay. All right, so that it just may be a mistranslation as Agag, just interpreting. Um, so, because here it's, it's because there's a mem in front of it in the Hebrew. And um, so that could be just a preface to a gag, but it could also be Magog. Right. So there's just an interpretive way in which um, that word could be translated. That's all. So the King James chose to translate it as, because um, the mem in front uh, means, um, uh, like it's just, well, because the, his king shall be higher than Agag, it says in the King James. Right. But that's, that mem is, is just uh, um, uh, connecting it grammatically. I can't think of the name of, of what they call that. But uh, like a comparison, like then, right? So, so they're just in true, interpreting it as higher than Agag, but it could be his king shall be as high as Magog, right? So just anyway, it, so we're not sure if that's actually a reference to Agag or not. That's all I'm saying in numbers. 
but prophetically, it would be interesting. Yeah, it, it would actually make more sense of Magog, especially in the context of what's being talked about um, in Balaam's prophecy. But uh, anyway, um, actually, I think it makes more sense as Magog. But uh, there's differences of opinion. But, uh, anyway, it could be Agag, it's hard to say. <clears throat> but but the point here is that we have these dates, right? So um, we could either, you know, start in 1533, we could start at 1493. So it'd be um, 110 years, if you count from 1493 to 483. Um, if you took off another 400, it'd be... Uh, 610 years between those events, you know, from Saul and Agag in 1093, so, so 610 years. Um, the point is that we have some kind of span of time from the past. That was, we have this conflict between Amalek and God's people, and then specifically with Saul and Amalek, with Agag, right? And so, so whether we're going to put that to, um, you know, to chapter one and say, well, that's a period of time that ends, and especially when you look at this dream in apocryphal Esther, right? So when we we think about how it's going to start off, uh, that's going to be, um, let me see here, right? So this is going to be the second year of the reign of, of Xerxes, not Arctic Xerxes. So here I'll just switch screens and see what I'm looking at. <clears throat> So in the second year of the reign of Artaxerxes, we're going to have this dream. So that's going to be in 484 BC, right? That uh, Mordecai has this dream. So he has this dream. Now that's not going to be fulfilled in the next year. That's not going to be fulfilled until, um, uh, chapter two but if we take this as an arrival of a first message um we could say that mordecai's dream is this first message right that his dream about these two dragons in conflict right which is going to be interpreted as this conflict between Mordecai and Haman, um, that this goes back to that conflict between Saul and Kish and even further back between Agag and, um, or the Amalekites and Israel when they're, when they're leaving Egypt. Right? So we're going to have a prophecy about it. The prophecy is going to be fulfilled in 400 years, but now it's going to be another, um, 600, whatever it was, 610 years or something like that. Can't remember now. Um, that it's going to come up again. Right? Right. So, so just taking it as a time of the end. And if we deal with the darkness, the darkness is this conflict that has been unresolved. So one is we know it's a type of the great controversy, right? Symbolically, if we're, we're going to take this line and apply it to our history, we're going to see that this is the great controversy in our time, that this is going to be the Sunday Sabbath issue, right? This is a conflict between, you know, Christ and Satan. Now here in this story, we're going to have two dragons that are fighting, right? 
and I'm just going to read this here. So in the second year of the reign of Artaxerxes, so that's going to be Xerxes, not Artaxerxes the Great. Uh, in the first day of the month Nisan, uh, Mordecai, the son of Jaira, I, I can't remember what it is in the King James, the son of Shimei, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin had a dream, who was a Jew and dwelt in the city of Susa, that's Shushan, a great man being a servitor in the king's court. He was also one of the captives which Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, carried from Jerusalem with uh, Jehoiachin, king of Ju Judah, and this was his dream. Now, the way it reads here, it says that he was one of the captives. Um, uh, but, you know, that because this if this is a trans translation from the Hebrew, I mean, they may have made a mistake in assuming that that this was referring to um, Mordecai as one of the captives. But it, it would much more likely be his father, uh, Jairus, who was actually the captive, not Mordecai himself. Because that would have been, he would be very, very old. So from the King James, um, it's, it seems more likely uh, that, that, that that's what the case is. So when it says he was also one of the captives, this could just be in, in translating this from the Hebrew and now they're putting it into Greek and now into English. That's, it, it seems to be referring to Mordecai, but it can't be. Okay. <clears throat> so in his dream, it says, behold, a noise of a tumult with thunder and earthquakes and uproar in the land. And behold, two great dragons came forth ready to fight and their cry was great. And at their cry, all nations were prepared to battle, that they might fight against the righteous people. And lo, a day of darkness and obscurity, tribulation and anguish, affliction and great uproar upon the earth. So we know that that symbolically in the Bible refers to the Sunday law, correct? We've discussed it as such. Yeah. Okay. So we can see that this is the great controversy. This is the issue at the end of the world. Um the whole righteous nation was troubled, fearing their own evils, and were ready to perish. Then they cried unto God, and upon their cry, as it were, from a little fountain was made a great flood, even much water. The light and the sun rose up, and the lowly were exalted, and devour, devoured the glorious. So, I mean, it'd be interesting to see exactly what the Hebrew would have been in this. Um, uh, because it's hard sometimes to compare these words. But one of the things here is we see this, the verse that they've given to this is 1111. And, and, and so we know 1111 is the Battle of Raphia, right? Right. Daniel 1111. Okay. And we know also all the symbols from 1111. Uh, that we have now. Um, and then when I think about the glorious, I wonder if that's like the glorious holy mountain. Right. Like whether that's that same type of word in Hebrew or it's some other word, but we don't know because I mean, I can look at the Greek, but the Greek's not going to tell you what the Hebrew said. So this is translated from the Greek. But now if where we have this, where it says the light and the sun rose up. Yeah. Symbolically, could this be showing us the end of the time of darkness? Well, that's what it seems like, right? So this, um, so this is the end of the period of darkness, right? Sun, the sun rose, said so sunrise. Okay, so now when Mordecai had seen this dream and what God had determined to do was awake, he bare the dream in his mind and until night by all means was desirous to know it. And Mordecai took his rest in the court with Gabatha and Tara, the two eunuchs of the king and keepers of the palace. And he heard their devices. So we can see um, uh, this was... Um, Bigtha and Teresh in the Hebrew. 
right? They got Gabatha and Thara here in the Greek. So you just, uh, why the, you know, I mean, they're quite a bit different. So transliterated. And we know that these are, are Persian names, but here these are Greek names. So they might have just put them into a more um, Greek form. So these are the two eunuchs of the king, the keepers of the palace. And he heard their devices and searched out their purposes and learned that they were about to lay hands upon Xerxes, the king. And so he certified the king of them. So the king made a record of these things. Mordecai also wrote thereof. So the king commanded Mordecai to serve in his court for thus, for this he rewarded him. Howbeit Haman, the son of Amadatha the Agite, who was in great honor with the king, sought to molest Mordecai and his people because of the two eunuchs of the king. So, um, so when they tell the story here, um, we're seeing something that's happening. This dream occurs in the second year of Xerxes. But this, this story is going to be much later, right? It's going to be at the time, but they're mentioning it here in connection with uh, the dream. So why particularly that is, um, in one we can see it's a different chapter. Um, so I don't know if I would have put this part here about uh, Haman discovering this plot. I don't think I would have placed it here. I think I would have uh, finished with 11, 12. And then this, 12, this one should be placed in a different spot. It was not Haman that discovered this plot. It was Mordecai. Yeah, they are. okay, yeah. Mordecai just dis discovered it, yeah. Did I say Haman discovered it? Yes. Okay. Haman was the one that did the plot. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Sorry about that because I'm trying to do, you know, a few things at a time. But yes. So Mordecai discovers this plot. Haman's involved in this plot. That's what's being um, hinted at here. So I'm just saying that this 12 verse 1 to 6, I wouldn't place here. Right. So they've placed it here. And, and this 11, chapter 11, they're placing it here because it's in the second year. But this is all just placed at the end of the book of Esther in Apocryphal F Esther. So these chapter and verses uh, have to do with the Apocrypha and where they placed these this Greek part of the story of Esther. But, but we know that this is chapter 2 where this plot is discovered, right? So it's just out of time, right? Because we're gonna have it here, more to disguise, the, discovers the plot. So when the virgins were gathered together the second time, then Mordecai sat in the king's gate. So that, that part of the story doesn't go there. That's all I'm trying to say. And we got Big Than and Tarash here. So it's basically the same story, but you can see how different it is and, and the details that are left out. So it doesn't mention, for instance, um, that both were hanged on a tree in this section here. And it doesn't mention anything about that. So, so it's a little bit different. So that's one of the things about the apocryphal Esther that we have to know is because it's not from Hebrew, it's from Greek. And um, and it may be sort of a paraphrasing Greek that is I mean, based upon what happens here at the end. It says here in the fourth year of the reign of Ptolemyus and Cleopatra Dosithus, Do 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 who said he was a priest and a Levite and Ptolemyus, his son brought the epistle of Purim, which they said was the, was the same, and that Lysimachus, the son of Ptolemyus, that was in Jerusalem, had interpreted it or translated it. So, um, so this this is put into this form in the Greek from a Hebrew 
manuscript. And so, so there are some differences, right? But we still can look at these things symbolically. We can say that in this story, uh, we could just say that Mordecai's dream is marking this time of the end, this first message. Is that seem fair to people that, that we can do that? People okay with taking Mordecai's dream from the Apocrypha and putting it on our line? <clears throat> I think that that would help us to, to establish the base of the line. Okay. So, um, how do you spell Mordecai? Is that how you spell it? How do you spell Mordecai? It just doesn't have an H in it, does it? No, it doesn't. Okay, there we go. And I think it is AI. Oh. It's AI. Yeah. There we go. There, that's better. Okay, so this is going to be the end of a period of time. So. Um, Okay, so this is ending a period of time. It's the time of the end. Um, so what, where are we going to say that period of time starts? Are we going to start it with the, the prophecy regarding that, or are we going to start when we deal with um, uh, Saul and Agag? So in 1093. I mean, we don't have to say what necessarily the period is. But if we go from 1093, you know, 609 years. And just do it that way, 609. So we have Saul and Agag, and then this descendant of Saul is going to have this dream that's going to be addressing this conflict between a descendant of Agag, Haman. Okay. Now, as far as 609, is there any significance in that? Yeah, there's some imagery in Daniel uh, that uh, uh, Angela's noted that's similar to this imagery, which I'd agree. Um, in, in that's just concerning uh, 400 years. Uh, yeah. I agree. I agree that it was given. The prophecy is given in 1493 BC. Yeah. And but when you look at what else um, Moses says later on in Deuteronomy? Yeah. He says that once you've destroyed your enemies, then you were to destroy Amalek. So really they were, first of all, to 
uh, take the land of Canaan. Yeah. And one, once they had done that, which I reckoned as um, what the Bible gives us six years from yeah. uh, from what Caleb says. So from that their time, I would say the 400 years begin. So that would be 1487. So that would run to 1087. That's how I would understand them 400 years. So that relates to the time when 10 years after Saul was reigning. Yeah. And when David was born as well at that their time. So mm -hmm. that's where I would have the 400 years ending. Yeah. yeah, the thing is just Ellen White's statement is still a little bit vague in the sense that she just says that, that the, the sentence is delayed for 400 years. Right? She does say that, yes. Right. So they fared or Yeah, so so we're not really sure where she's counting that four hundred years from. Right? It's it's you know, is she counting it from the prophecy or is she counting it from when it was supposed to happen? Um and then uh it seems to me though, I I mean I think it's better to place the end of the four hundred years or the, the the event where it happens um, in earlier in Saul's reign than that. But but anyway, we, we just have six hundred and nine years if we go from the prophecy. But exactly where to start that and even where to end it, because we know it's going to be um, you know, this is the time of the end, so we're just marking how long it is between that prophecy. Yeah, and this event, or not the prophecy, the, when when the event is fulfilled. So when Saul and Agag have their conflict, it's still going to be about 609 years, right? Even if we count the 400 years differently. Does that make sense? Well, it's going to be in that reason, yes. Yeah, because it's... Because it's when when Saul comes in contact with Agag, and now we have Mordecai and Haman. So, so we got Mordecai's dream, which I should put in there. Okay, so we have his dream, and that's going to be about six hundred and nine years after. Uh, Saul and Agag have their conflict. So that's all. That's all we can really say about that. Um, you know, it might be slightly different. It might, but that's that's what we have. Okay. Um. So that's the dream. So, so what is the formalization? Because we're saying that the first message is chapter one. Um, so we get the first angel arriving. We need a formalization. We need an empowerment. So how does the story of Xerxes stirring up all against the realm of Grisha have anything to do with Mordecai's dream? I mean, it's not going to be till chapter two that we're going to have the, the conflict with Haman and uh, Mordecai. But remember, Mordecai has a dream and there are going to be, be events leading to when his dream is fulfilled, so to speak. Right? Now, it doesn't give us an exact time either um, for this dream, like a specific date. It's just, wait, um, actually it does. The first day of the month, Nissan. Okay, so it's going to be Nissan 1. So that's going to be the first day of the first month. And it's in Esther 1-1. So... 
So it's ester 1, 1, but it's 11, 2, right? It's just they're putting it as the first verse. But we're going to say that's the first day of the first month. So we can put a date there. Okay. So in other words, it's the first day of the first month of the second year of Xerxes reign, right? Yep. Yeah, that's what I'm going to put down at the bottom here. First day, first month, second year. Oops, that didn't work. Got to use the right computer. First, first. There, that's the right keyboard. Okay, so we get the first day, first month. So we have that symbol of the first day of the first month. Now, now we can actually give a specific date to that then, right? Because we know in in Xerxes' reign when that is. So it's going to be the second year. Um, Uh, that's going to be, according to the Babylonian calendar, that's going to be March 26th, 484. So, so, so is that going to be 31 years after the temple is dedicated? Um, okay. Um, so yeah, because the temple is dedicated in uh, 515. Yeah, so it's going to be roughly 31 years. If I'm doing that correctly. Yeah. Um, is it 31? Yeah, 31 years. So it's it's going to be. You know, 31 years from the first day of the first month in 515. Okay, that makes sense. So we got a specific date for his dream. Now, the first day of the first month, of course, is important, right? Because we have been using that symbol all through, right? Uh, we've used it. Um, and so this is uh, one year to the day from when the 187 days is going to commence. Okay. So, so I'm just going to say um, that the first day of the first month in the third year is going to be this uh, formalization. That is, he's going to start this process. The 187 days are going to begin, and then uh, the empowerment would be that 187-day period ending. So we're going to take, say, the 10th day of the seventh month in the third year. And that's going to be, so this is going to be, I just got to put the actual dates. <clears throat> it wouldn't still be March 26th and 483. Nope. No, it's not going to be. It's going to be uh, April 14th. And then uh, this date is going to be uh, 
October 17th. Okay. Okay. Makes sense. So we can see we got these three dates. So these are all going to be, well, one year and 187 days. 570 days after his dream, Vashti is going to be deposed as queen. Right? Okay, so how many days is it then between the dream and uh, October 17th of 483, not 484? Yeah, I didn't change that yet. Yeah, so that's going to be 570 days. Okay. It's, it's 384 plus 186. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> so 570 days between those. So Xerxes is going to stir up all against the realm of Grisha. I'll just call it his planning. So Xerxes planning. And then uh, Vashti being deposed. Okay. Makes sense. So you got 384 days. You put that in there just so people have it. Oops, 384. And 186. So the cardinal counts at 186. But does that first symbol of the 26th of March relate to anything else that we've addressed in the past? Not that I know of. Two, six, three. Not that I, I don't know anything about 263. Um, now, uh, the Gregorian date is March 21st. But, but that's just, I don't know if that's important or not, just that that is. Um, so the thing about that date, uh, because with the Babylonian calendar, you can see, of course, the connection with the um, the equinox, because you're going to use the equinox as the time in which you decide whether or not you're going to add an extra month. Right. So in that year, um, they're they're going to add that extra month. That is, the the new moon is going to be sighted um, after the spring equinox, and so so they have to add that extra month, or at least they should, but they don't. That is, the Babylonians decide, no, we don't need the extra month yet, but on the biblical calendar we do, right? So there's a difference here. So if you looked at the first of Nisan in 484, there would um, it would it would end up being in April. Well, the reason 
the reason I was asking that, I thought 263 had some relationship to one of the studies we had done in the book of Acts. Um, because as I look at April 14th, if I express it in the European version, it would be uh, 14th day of the fourth month or 144. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I think you, the number there in, in, in Acts is there's, um, it's, it's 273. So okay. there's not 263. So All that's right. going to be uh, the number of the Levites. So there's 276 people on the ship. Okay. Right. And then I stand corrected. Yeah. Okay. Um, So, where is this? I'm just going to show you share this screen. Yeah, I mean, you could obviously, you know, take those three digits and connect it to Muhammad's death, but I don't know. I don't think it, it would be relevant in this context. But, uh, okay. So, I just want to show you here. So, when we go to this year... Um, yeah, you can see it says, oops, that's not the right, I got to put a zero there. Okay. So you can see it says 484 minus 483. Minus 483, that's going to be uh, a Gregorian count because they have the zero year. And then we're going to go back here into the month of March. So, so the Babylonians in 484 BC, that's the date there. Um, when you look at March 21st, uh, let me see, where is it here? Okay. So, so this is March 26th. So you can see the, the spring equinox on the Julian calendar is March 26th. And they're going to have that as the first day of the first month. So they should say, well, the new moon is going to be sighted. If that's the first day of the first month, that means they sighted the new moon on the 25th. And technically speaking, the new moon occurred before the spring equinox. So you should add an extra month. I don't know if you can see that very clearly down at the bottom. When I do this, I think I have to go like that. The text goes smaller. But the spring equinox happens here on the 26th. So and I guess if I make that bigger, the diagrams, okay, that looks better. But the new moon would be sighted on the 25th, right? So the new moon is being sighted before the spring equinox. So you should add an extra month. The, the Babylonians weren't that particular about how they added their new year. So, so we don't know particularly why, how they, I mean, we know how they determined the spring equinox, but as long as it was close to the spring equinox, they would um, just start the month. It would be if the new moon happened quite a bit before the spring equinox, uh, they would add the month if it happened um, in conjunction with the spring equinox, they wouldn't add the extra month. So they would just start the year. So they just started the year, even though technically they should have added an extra month. Anyway, that's what happens in 484. So I'm assuming that the calendar that's being used uh, by Mordecai would be the Babylonian calendar because he's in Babylon and he's just going to use the local calendar and he uses the month Nisan, right? So one of the things about, you know, you can't say they always do it this way, but the Babylonians don't number the months. So that's one thing we know. Uh, the only ones that number those months uh, starting in the spring are the Jews. So when they talk about something in the first month, 
then they're they're using their numbering from the spring. But if they use just uh, you know the name of the month, it's it sometimes could be the Babylonian name of the month. That is, it's a Babylonian name. So they're not really technically naming those months, except that they borrow this naming system from the Babylonians. So I'll show you what I mean here. I know this is a little bit technical, but uh, the more we go over these types of things, um, the better, because you start to get an idea of how they work. So for instance, if you go to um, the book of Haggai, in Haggai it says, in the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth month, in the first day of the month. You can see that if they're numbering the months here, that's going to be a biblical date. Does that make sense to people? That is, you can't say the sixth month and be referring to a Babylonian calendar because the Babylonians don't number the months. And here they're going to talk about the seventh month in the 20th day of the month, right? So again, we're going to say that's a biblical date. But it doesn't, um, so, so we're going to say that that's sometimes the case. But in Ezekiel, he's always going to number the months. But I take the, I take the case that even though he's numbering the months, he's numbering them He's numbering them because, um, so, so we could argue, he's saying he's numbering the months, so maybe he must be using the biblical month, right? Because why isn't he saying, um, instead of in the fourth month, why doesn't he say in the month Tammuz in the fifth day of the month? But I think that's just a peculiarity of Ezekiel, that he's going to number the months even if he's using the Babylonian months. But he's numbering he's numbering the months from a biblical perspective, but as far as the day of the month, he's using the Babylonian count is the way that I understand it. Does that make sense? Or am I confusing yeah. people? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. Right. So because when you determine that a month has begun, it's done by consensus. That is, the rabbinic Jews way later, like hundreds of years after the time of Christ, they're going to tell you that, well, in the old days, the way that they did it is they would be at the temple in Jerusalem and there would be some priests and they would wait for that new moon. And when they saw it, then they would proclaim that new moon. But this is something hundreds of years later of them uh arguing about the calendar and they're arguing about the calendar the rabbinic jews are in um a time of controversy that is they're disputing in many of these cases they're disputing with the karaites right so there there arises this controversy about the calendar and and so the rabbis make up stuff Right. It's just like people making up stuff nowadays about, you know, lunar Sabbaths or whatever. People are in a controversy. So they're not really they don't really have the information to tell you what the truth is. Uh, they're going to claim that some rabbi said something some time ago. And, and based upon these imaginary words of some rabbi hundreds of years before. That, you know, here is how we do the calendar. but it's not really that logical um, because if we, if we go back into the past of how people would look at the sky, people would observe the sky. Now, not everybody's going to be up, be up at night, especially certain times of the year, observing the sky to see, to look for the new moon. And, and there could be times that they don't see it but maybe their neighbors did see it. So there would be a type of consensus. 
because there was no official calendar. Remember, people aren't like us. They're not, the way that they look at time is different. So, and, and I know I'm going into this long explanation about this, and maybe it's not an important point at this at this time, but the thing that we need to recognize is that there are different ways of doing the calendar. There's different ways of counting things out. And some people are really adamant that something's done a certain way, but yet we don't really have that information. Um, if we look at another book here, where is this? If you look at the book of Nehemiah, for instance, see, this is where we see these sorts of inconsistencies. So in the book of Nehemiah, um, it says, The words of Nehemiah, the son of Halakai, it came to pass in the month Kislev, right? No, it says Chislev, but it's Kislev. In the 20th year, I was in Shushan, the palace, right? So this is going to be Artaxerxes' second decree. Um, and it's going to call this the 20th year. And then in chapter two, came to pass in the month Nisan in the 20th year of Artaxerxes the king. So chapter one comes before chapter two chronologically. I mean, it's before. So notice that he's counting the month Nisan as still in the 20th year of Artaxerxes. Now we know Artaxerxes counted his reign spring to spring. So this is one of these places where scholars can say, well, the Jews are counting Artaxerxes' reign fall to fall. Because if in uh, the month Kislev, which is the ninth month of the year, and then you're going to come around again to the first month of the next year on our calendar, but you're still going to call it the 20th year of Artaxerxes, that means you're counting his reign fall to fall, or at least in some other way, right? Now, you might be counting an ordinal count from when he came, began to reign as well. So people aren't sure if it's exactly fall to fall or from when his reign began. So there's speculation. But notice they're going to use the, the, the Babylonian names, Kislev and Nisan, right? I mean, they're Hebraized because Nisanu technically, and uh can't remember how they say the Babylonian uh, ninth month. But you're going to see these inconsistencies. And people try to make a lot out of it. Like, But just know that they're not as precise as we are. So, um, so anyway. Hopefully that's helpful. That little excursion gives you a little bit of information. So when we go here in the second year of the reign of Artaxerxes, in the first day of the month, Nisan, the point that I'm saying here is that he's using the name Nisan, which is the Babylonian month. But if he was looking at the biblical calendar, it would have to be second Adar. Right? That's, that's the whole reason I've gone through this. Because... If he had said the first day of the first month and he meant the biblical calendar, that's going to start in April in that year. But he's going to say the first day of the month, Nisan. And so my argument is that we're not going to look at the April date on the biblical calendar. We're going to look at the March date on the Babylonian calendar. So that's the reason I went through that explanation. Is, is that helpful? That's why we have March 26th and not um, whatever it'd be, April uh, 20, 24th or something like that. Okay? Yeah, I'd say it. I'd say it was helpful. Okay, good. Yeah. I, know it, I know it's complicated. It's not the, the simplest thing uh, to understand. So that's why we're using these dates and these numbers. So we can see that we're going to have 384 day year because we're going from the first day of the first month to the first day of the first month. The longest a Hebrew year can be three is 385 days because if you have a leap year, it can be 383. 
384, 385 days, depending on how the new moons fall within that year, how long the months are. And if it's a shorter year, it's 353, 354, 355. So they never have a year of 360 or 365. It's always those other six numbers. And then it's on, and then they're going to have this feast. So Xerxes begins on the first day of the first month. And he has a 180 day feast. And, and that would be an inclusive count. Right? And then he's going to have a seven day feast. That would be an inclusive count. So if you add 180, plus 170 or plus 180 plus 70 and they're both inclusive you would have a cardinal count of 186 days right so so from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month now i'm using the biblical date there technically it would be the ninth day of the seventh month on the babylonian calendar because they count every single month but on the biblical calendar it's always going to be 186 on the Babylonian from the first day of the first month to the 10th day of the seventh month. It's mostly 186 cardinal days, but sometimes um, it is 187 cardinal days. So, so we're, we're just going to the 10th day of the seventh month on the biblical calendar. So just keeping it simple. So as far as the darkness, the darkness has to do with what then? This sort of unresolved conflict between Saul and Agag. So why is that unresolved conflict a part of this story? What's the symbolism there? Is there a symbol, symbolism connected with Saul and Agag? And we have this in Mordecai's dream too. Keep that in mind. Because if we deal with the Amalekites, what are they symbolizing when they attack Israel, when they're fleeing Egypt? Well, looking at Deuteronomy 25. Oh, they, uh, yeah, go ahead, Stephen. Yeah, it's just uh, Satan. Okay. Yeah, yeah okay. Fear not God. It, they attack, attack the, the, the Israelites who are fleeing when they are feeble and weary. God holds that against the Amalekites, the descendants. Right, so, so we can see that this is Satan's attack upon God's people. So the Amalekites are representing that. So, so even when we think about this, this story of the prophecy in whatever it is, Deuteronomy 24, verse 17, or something like that. Um, 25, 17 through 19. 20, 20, 25, Deuteronomy 24. Right. Okay. Right. So remember, it's it's going to be about remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when ye were come forth out of Egypt. How he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee. Um, um, even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary, and he feared not God. Right, so then it says in verse 19, Therefore it shall be when the Lord thy God hath given thee rest from all thine enemies round about, 
in the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance to possess it. But thou shalt blot out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. Thou shalt not forget it. So Stephen is saying, well, we're going to look at that six years later. And um, I have a disagreement about when they have rest from their enemies. But anyway, um, so blotting out the remembrance of Amalek, he's going to count the 400 years from there. Ellen White talks about 400 years. So it's it's going to be delayed um, um, so so instead of doing it from the prophecy of Deuteronomy, he's going to do it from when they have rest from their enemies and count 400 years. So because Ellen White talks about this, this is delayed for 400 years. Now, of course, we don't know if she's speaking exactly 400 years. Could be just a round number. But uh, the point is, uh, it's this prophecy here that's being addressed. Right. So if we're going to look at a prophecy, it's it's a prophecy about Amalek. And and that prophecy then is uh, supposed to be fulfilled by Saul. But Saul lets Agag go. Right. Well, he captures him. So uh, let's let's look at that story. Um, So it's going to be in 1 Samuel. Now, of course, Agag is is considered a title. And um, we're just going to look here at the Hebrew, right? So it's it's this number 90, means of flame, uh, and it's just Aleph, Gimel, Gimel is how it's spelled, Agag. And, and in that other place that we saw it, it had a mem in front of it, uh, the letter M. Uh, oops, that's not what I wanted to do. I want to do this. Okay, so we have Agag, king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. So he, so Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep and of the auction and of, of the fat wings and the lambs. And all the good, and would not utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Then came the word of the Lord unto Samuel, saying, Repenteth me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me, and hath not performed my commandments. <coughs> they grieved Samuel, and he cried unto the Lord all night. And when Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a place and has gone about and passed on and gone down to Gilgal. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou of the Lord. I have performed the commandment of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then the bleeding of the sheep in mine ears, and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? And Saul said, they brought, they have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the oxen to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God, and the rest we have utterly destroyed. And Samuel said unto Saul, stay and I will tell thee what the Lord hath said to me this night. And he said unto him, say on. And Samuel said, when thou wast little in thine own sight, thou wast not made head of the tribes. Wast thou not made head of the tribes of Israel? And the Lord anointed thee king over Israel. And the Lord sent thee on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they be consumed. Therefore, then didst thou not obey the voice of the Lord, but didst fly upon the spoil and didst evil in the sight of the Lord. And Saul said unto Samuel, Yea, I have obeyed the voice of the Lord and have gone the way which the Lord sent me and have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and oxen, so he's blaming the people, of course, the chief of the things which should have been utterly destroyed, to sacrifice unto the Lord thy God in Gilgal. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, 
and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and um, stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath rejected thee from being king. And Saul said unto Samuel, I have sinned, for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and thy words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. So Saul needs to take a course on how to make an apology and a confession. Right? Uh, you, you see this all the time. I, I watched a video about um, a guy explaining uh, how not to make an apology. And he used uh, Alan Degenerate as an example. Um, the one thing that you don't do when you apologize is blame somebody else for your actions. Right? Correct. Yeah, you hear that a lot. <laughs> All, yeah. Everywhere. Especially the person you're apologizing. <laughs> yeah, especially if you, especially the person you're apologizing. If you blame them uh, for your actions, it's really not much of an apology. It isn't. No. Uh, you just well, take not an apology at all. <laughs> yeah, but but we see that happen. People make these apologies where, well, I'm sorry I hurt you, but it's just because basically. You did this or that. That's why I did this. But I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so he feared the people and obeyed their voice. So he's blaming them. I mean, this is Adam and Eve all over again. But um, now, therefore, I pray thee, pardon my sin and turn again with me that I may worship the Lord. And Samuel said unto Saul, I will not return with thee, for thou hast rejected the word of the Lord. And the Lord hath rejected thee from being king over Israel. And as Samuel turned about to go away, he laid hold upon the skirt of his mantle, and it rent. And Samuel said unto him, The Lord hath rent the kingdom of Israel from thee this day, and hath given it to a neighbor of thine that is better than thou. Okay. Um, so, and then Samuel said, Bring me hither to, bring me hither to me Agag the king of the Amalekites. And Agag came unto him, delicately and Agag said surely the bitterness of death is past and Samuel said as the sword hath made women childless so shall thy mother be, be childless among women and Samuel hewed Agag in pieces before the Lord in Gilgal so and the reason that's why I read this here because I was pretty sure that Samuel killed Agag so so Agag is killed but we're going to have Haman, who's a descendant. He's an Agagite. So that means he's a descendant of Agag. Now, some people say, well, Agag is just a title. Um, and that, that could be, that, or a common name. But we still have to say that uh, Haman is connected to Agag in some way. So... Even though Agag's killed, we don't know. Maybe some descendant of his survived. I don't know, right? All I know is that Agag is going to be killed, but Saul doesn't kill him as he's supposed to. Now, it's also interesting that it's going to be in 1 Samuel 15.33 that Agag is hewn in pieces. So, so this story, it connects us to 1533, right? So that's the year that the Israelites leave Egypt. And we have, of course, from August 11th, 1840 to October 22nd, 1844. A wonderful manifestation of the power of God, both in the Exodus and in Millerite history. Um, so the slaying of Agag, the slaying of the Amalekites, what is the symbol then that is being employed? We already talked about it. So this has to do with Satan, right? So we're going to have this conflict, and this conflict is now going to be worked out in this story in the book of Esther.
Any other thoughts on this, on, on what we can do with this story? Any observations? Well, in this, are we not seeing the cause and effect of not following God's express word? Yes. And, and we know that um, we have an enemy that has to be defeated. Right. So, so one of the things we've discussed a lot in this movement has to do with how we are to study. Right. And... You know, when it comes to the issue of the great controversy, the Sunday law, I mean, the difference between those that um, pass the Sunday law test and those that don't um, is really a spiritual issue. It's not it's not so much about the knowledge that a person has, because there's going to be many people who know Saturday is the Sabbath. And not only are they going to fail that Sunday law test, they're actually going to be promoting Sunday. Um so it's not going to be the knowledge about the Saturday Sabbath issue that's going to save those. It's going to be how we have obeyed God in all the things that he's given us to obey him in. But that that is connected with studying God's word. And the more we study God's word, the greater power we have to obey God. And people who haven't studied for themselves are going to have a very weak conviction and thus weak power when it comes to having to stand for Christ in that trying hour. So now the other thing that we have discussed, because when we deal with the Amalekites, remember they're 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 doing the work of the adversary, right? That is gossip, rumor, innuendo, slander, libel if it's written down, right? And, and Heidi and I have been reading about this in Five Testimonies. That means that seems to be the biggest thing Five Testimonies is about, is about the condition of the church, especially in the area of how we speak about our brethren, how we speak regarding the servants that God has chosen to uh, give a message. Never are we to, you know, spread rumors and gossip, uh, stories about people's characters. And, and even with the individuals themselves, we, are, we seek to do everything we can uh, to encourage and help that person. We learned in the Friday night study, you know, how God puts his confidence in us. He doesn't look at us suspiciously, even though he knows we could fail. He entrusts us, you know, with a with responsibility. You know, we could look at how he gives us, you know, if you look at the, the talent, you know, God gives the talent um, to everybody based upon um our abilities of what we could do with that ta those talents, you know, those opportunities uh, to serve God. And, and if we squander or just bury that talent, if we don't do anything, we, we do destructive work because that's what, what's often being done is, is work that's destructive. There's no way, way that we're going to be able to stand in the Sunday law. It doesn't matter if we got the right ideas about, how the Sunday law is going to come, or even if we, we, we think we know when it's going to come, when it's going to come, we're not going to be ready, right? Because of how we behave, because we're, we're disobedient to God. So this, this knowledge that we think is so important, it's only important and useful if we are actually obeying God. If we're not obeying God, the, the knowledge of the truth is more an albatross around our neck, you know, to reference the rhyme of the ancient mariner, right? 
And, and so it's not going to benefit us. It's going to be our damnation, the fact that we know the truth. If we're not obeying God. So, so this work of Satan, I mean, this is something that is being addressed here. Now, now Mordecai himself is disobeying God. I mean, he's, he's in uh, Shushan, right? He's not in Jerusalem where he's supposed to be. Esther, as we're going to see, you know, isn't obeying God. But we have this dream of Mordecai. And it's going to happen one year before Xerxes begins planning uh, the campaign against Greece. And it's going to result in Vashti being deposed in the end. And, and this is going to lead. So this first message is going to lead to the second message, right? So we know we can understand the period of darkness. It has to do with deal with this unresolved, um, problem in this movement, right? Because as we're going to look at this, we're going to start to see how we're going to place this in our time. But there's an unresolved problem in this movement. And the one thing I want to show you before we go into, uh, you know, before we end this, because in our history, we have the first day of the first month. And, and where do we mark the first day of the first month in our history? 2001. Right, so November 9th, 2019. Now we also have another uh, date. So we also have 9-11, right? So can we not take this, um, this story here and, and do this? Let's do it. Can we not say that this is 9-11 and that this is 11-9 and that this is July 18th? Okay, can we do that? Everybody happy with that? Sorry about that. It's okay. So, yeah, so Samuel says it's logical, right? Because we have these two first days of the first month. We have them in our history. We've connected 9-11 with the first day of the first month. And we've also connected 11-9 with the first day of the first month. And, and so we can easily see how that just falls into place. So in our history, uh, we would have to then see how Mordecai's dream, Xerxes planning, and uh, Vashti being deposed is connected with this message regarding Saul and Agag. And that this is something that's needful for this movement to, to understand. Not just understand intellectually, but to understand through experience. But we need to recognize that this message has to do its effect, have its effect upon us. If we're going to be ready for the events that follow. And so so here we can I think it should be clear to everybody where where we're going with this, where, where what we see. Okay, and we didn't know this before we started this study. So this is just from this study, this hour and a half of going through this, sort of piecing through it in this way. Uh, something just jumps out of us at us that's very obvious. Okay, so we we can connect this to our history. 
So it's not just some story about Mordecai and Haman and Xerxes, and Vashti and Esther. It's a story about us and our spiritual condition. And it's this battle, something that should have been resolved a long time ago, but it still keeps creeping up. Exactly. Right? And, and we've never dealt with it, right? And, and part of the problem that we have is, you know, we're a movement that comes out of the Adventist church and we've inherited the attitude of the church. And in some ways, we're worse than the church. And how the church dealt with us, we deal with each other at least as badly, if not worse, than the church dealt with us. So let's close with prayer. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. We pray that it will do a work upon our hearts. We know, Lord, that we are unconverted, that, uh, that what is being expressed here is something about us. We just pray, Lord, that you can forgive us for our sins. Help us to encourage your people. Be with us throughout this day and bring us together again to study your word. According to thy will, we pray and ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.